Hi everyone, um, welcome to a very, very hot and sweaty broadcast live from Clapham in London. Um, I don't know if it's going to be hot where you guys are. Um, please do tell me that you're feeling as hot as I am. Um, probably I feel one of the most unattractive I've ever felt in my life. Um, any makeup I've had on is just off. Um, so um, please do make me feel better and tell me how much, you know, you're enjoying the sun actually. I want to hear more positive things. Um, but hi to everybody who has not joined us before or has joined us before. So um, welcome to the virtual coffee and chat with me, Anna. Um, so for those who haven't caught one of our sessions before, we host a weekly virtual coffee and chat on Facebook and YouTube. Um, and it's basically a way to kind of connect you guys, connect me as well, but connect us to the stories that matter. Um, and that could be from young people's perspectives, that could be from researchers, that could be from practitioners. Um, we, I want to hear how the children's society are adapting and also how the young people are adapting and what more do we need to do to help the future basically because young people as we keep saying every single week are the future and um, so i'm anna and i'm part of the fundraising and marketing team we have like a big big long name which is irrelevant right now so it's fine um but yeah if you've got any questions for me not that i could probably answer any um please do comment but I would love to hear where you're listening from and how you found us, actually. That'd be really, really great. Um, so I'm not sure if you've realized or if you've been avoiding the news, um, but every day we've been faced with updates about the effect and the impact of COVID-19 on not only people's physical health um, and mental health, but the new restrictions that have come into place, what we have to follow, what we don't have to do, jobs, the economy, and more. And just today, it's been announced that we are officially in a recession, as Britain's economy has shrank a, a fifth in the last quarter, which for me, I don't really understand any of that stuff, but that sounds quite a big deal. Um, so for me, that's worrying. But how does that affect children? I'm sure they're probably feeling that as much as I'm feeling it, maybe even worse, depending on their situation. Life was already very, very tough for children up and down the country, but coronavirus has made those kids' lives even harder. Even before the coronavirus crisis, um, happiness was at a 10 year low. And since lockdown, even more of young people have told us they're really, really struggling. So today, um, I am going to be joined by Richard Krellin, who is here to talk to me just about that. So without further ado, I will bring on Richard. Hi, Anna. Um, Richard um, is very lucky because he is in um, the White Cross Studios, our uh, office in London, and he's not feeling the heat right now. <laughs> As you can I, tell on the difference. <laughs> in an air conditioned, oh, it's absolutely glorious. Um, I even had to step outside just to warm up. So I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be in this office today. It's the first time I've been in since March uh, when wow. we went into town and it is, it's a little bit surreal, but um, mm. feeling really good today. So you've got me on a good day, which is nice. Oh, great. Well, everybody who's, um, who's watching, I'm sure might be very jealous of you. Um, depending on their situation. But um, thank you for joining us. And we'll be talking a little bit later more about the impact of COVID has had on young people and what the Children's Society are recommending. But before we get into that, we're gonna play a little game, our favorite, fan favorite, which is the 60 second game. So, <laughs> which I actually completely forgot to tell Richard about until like 20 minutes ago. So, sorry. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds simple enough. I should manage. Yeah. So, Beth from our, the start, a volunteer with the star group, she managed to hit 20. Yeah. So, we're going to get them. I'm just going to get my really fancy timer out. Um, 
because I've not yet worked out how I can put a timer on here yet. So I just have to use my phone, um, which is, you know, high tech. It does the trick. <laughs> it does the trick. Okay. So one minute on the clock, starting from now. Hot or cold weather? Oh, cold weather. Chinese or Italian? Italian. Sunrise or sunset? Sunset. TV or film? TV. Board games or video games? Board games. Books or movies? Um, movies. What do you normally order at fish and chips? Uh, large cotton chips. <laughs> First job? Um, oh, I was a tarmacker. I laid roads. Oh my gosh. What's your favorite dish? Um, oh, that's really hard. Um, uh, a steak. <laughs> uh, mayo or ketchup? Oh, mayo. Favorite cereal? Oh, I'm not really a big fan of cereal. I guess oh. like a wee mix, but just because, you know, whatever. <laughs> App but last one, Apple or Android phone? Oh, I'm an Apple, yeah. Okay, so you got 12. Not great. <laughs> I didn't want to say, but it's okay. Um, I'm more interested in the tarmac in. Um, yeah. That's, I've not heard that as a first job. How, uh, how did that go? Um, it was different. Um, I was like 16, I just finished my GCSEs and I joined this tarmacking um, company for like the summer and I just was like spread tarmac and it was it was a lot for 16 year old me but it was it was good. Yeah. And I can imagine especially in the heat. Um, yeah, it's quite a hot job, particularly in the summer um, and you just get covered in the tarmac's very sticky and so yeah, it's been a lot of time. Oh. Well, um, it has made me like have a love of the smell of tarmac when it's being laid, which some people find odd, but for me, like I really like the smell of tarmac when it's being laid. So, you know, all good. I love that. I love that. Um, that's very interesting. And I'm sure not many people have had that as their first job as a 16 year old. I don't think it's a super common first job. Um, no. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it got me some money. It was good. There you go. That's all you can ask for. <laughs> okay. So, needs to get into the nitty gritty. So your job is policy and research manager and you um, it's especially about mental health and well-being. Now we've heard across the news every single day about how we're now worried about the impact on our mental health and children's mental health and like even NHS staff because it's been go 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 all the time. So can you tell me a bit more about the research you your and your you and your team particularly carried out? Of course, yeah. So um we're really lucky um at the Children's Society because um we've been researching children's well-being now for so many years and we have our kind of annual process to understand, you know, what's the latest trends in children's well-being, what's going on, what are they feeling, what are they thinking? And um this year it was kind of unavoidable that we had to kind of ask the question, right, about coronavirus. Mm. There was really no other alternative. Um, and it was, it's was it been absolutely fascinating the last six months um, going through the process. But um, we went out for our annual survey that we do every year. And that is a representative sample of uh, young people in the UK so that we can get a really good idea about how different groups are affected and in different regions and all groups, things like that. Um, and we asked them about coronavirus and how they were coping. Um, mm. We asked them you know, what they were struggling with, um, we asked them, you know, how they'd adapted to what was going on. And um, it was a really interesting kind of insight, really, um, mm. to be able to do that. And I guess what were some of the key findings? I mean, I think the most important thing is to say that most children and young people told us that they were coping. So they said oh. that they were coping with what's going on. And that doesn't mean that it hasn't been difficult. But they said, mm. you know, what, I am managing, even though it's difficult. The things that they were finding most difficult um, were actually things like not being able to see their friends and family and they said that they'd adapted quite well to some of the things like social distancing being at home and that kind of thing but um it was more that kind of relational stuff that seeing the people that you care about the people that matter to you mm. that they really were finding the most difficult um and 
because we do this every year, we can get a snapshot about how well-being is changing and, and what things young people might be struggling with more or less. And normally when we do this survey, um, we kind of find that between 11 and 13 percent of young people would tell us that they have low well-being. Mm. Um, so they're ones who are, you know, they're unhappy with their lives. They're finding things really difficult. Um, and this year that was 18 percent. So that was a really notable increase for us mm. that actually, you know, kind of almost, you know, 50 percent more young people than we would normally expect saying, actually, I'm really I'm really not enjoying life right now and I'm not happy with the quality of my life. Um, so that was really important. And the other thing was that um, we asked them about a range of different aspects of life. So we asked them about their friends, their family, their health, their home. And normally young people tell us that the things they're most unhappy with um, are school and their appearance mm. usually come right down the bottom. Um, and this year it was choice. So they were saying, you know, I'm really struggling that I've got no freedom. I've got no choice anymore. I've got no mm. autonomy. I can't make any decisions. I've just got to do as I'm told all the time. And um, I think that's a really obvious finding, I guess. Like it totally makes yeah. sense. But it's really important to um, recognize just how much freedom we've taken away from young people during mm. this process and about what that means for them and how they feel about their lives. Yeah, that's actually quite interesting because um, a lot of people's maybe um, perception of kids is that they don't want to go to school, that um, they actually love, because they love summer holiday. But you actually find that when they come back from summer holiday, they're so, so excited because they, kids and well, everybody misses that element of structure sometimes. But also one of the quotes I saw um, from one of the young people, I think um, he was a 13 year old male and he said, it's quite scary because you can die from it. I'm also scared that school has um, will close down. I'm also worried about my exams next year. I'm gonna need my exams to get a job. So it's the element as well that I found just reading the report and the highlights from it, that it's also kids want that element of choice. And that's not just to be able to say, I wanna go down to the park with my friends. It's also the choice to make decisions and learn from them and also to uh, decisions about their future, which I think is being taken away from them just today about the A-level results, about actually no, they can go on their mock results. But when I did my mocks, I didn't put, sorry, mum, I didn't put that much effort into it because I knew they were mocks. Um, yeah. So you don't have that extra school time and stuff. Um, but um, you did say that it's not all doom and gloom. Yeah. Um, what was the positives that came out of the research? So there were lots of different things, really. I think the thing that I think was probably most positive and really important is that, you know, going into it, if you'd have, if you'd have asked me to place a bet on what I thought people would have been struggling with, I think I would have said, oh, you know, they're definitely going to be struggling with being at home and being with their family all the time, mm. right? Because it's, you know, being in close quarters, it's difficult, that kind of thing. Actually, the scores around how happy children are with their families held up remarkably well. Mm -hmm. I think for a lot of families, this period of being together has actually improved that family dynamic. They've like mm -hmm. managed to relationships and so it's actually really um, incredible that that's the case. And I was a bit like, well, maybe that's, you know, the general population, but what, what's that like for some of our young people? And some of the practitioners I've talked to have said, you know what, actually just slowing down a little bit for families where there's lots of stuff going on, there are lots of challenges, there can be um, lots of problems has actually really helped mm. them kind of like be able to kind of, you know, see the wood for the trees and be able to kind mm. of reconnect so for me I think that's the most important bright side of it um, but there were lots of other things as well um, young people told us a lot about how they'd been looking after themselves um, mm. and it was amazing that they'd managed to you know one young person was saying you know oh I, 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 I hadn't played the guitar for like four five six years and I picked it up again and I'm playing again and really enjoying that um, other ones saying you know they're doing art they're doing music they're kind of um, painting drawing writing so there's a lot of stuff that's been going on that's actually been really this stuff's really good for well-being like some of this simple stuff some of this like kind of being creative getting active this stuff is all really important and actually lockdown has helped people and i don't mm. think just young people i think adults as well to just kind of like oh what do i enjoy doing what makes yeah. me happy and do more of it so i think that's really good too. yeah exactly and also just from talking to my friends and maybe some of my friends who are teachers or um have young kids and they've said that actually their kids or kids they know have actually become a lot more invested in the future. So then they're thinking about their future in a positive way. So they want to help more. They want to think about 
how what future jobs they could have um which i think was was really really lovely because you know you as everyone keeps saying we are living through a pandemic so we're okay to not feel okay all the time um but actually it's also good to take stock of what you have um and to feel grateful for those aspects like i know i'm very very grateful for um, my shared house living accommodation um i know i'm very lucky with that and um but it's also okay to want to go into the office <laughs> soon <laughs> we want to go to the office um but it's but it was just really remarkable hearing all these young people talking about well i know it's tough but it will get better and um i want to be able to help more and i just i think those things are just beautiful to hear about as well definitely i think there's something about how we've had to kind of reassess particularly um what matters you know we talk about key workers now and that includes you know, all sorts of different professions from delivery drivers to care workers mm -hmm. nurses to doctors and actually you know maybe we had different kind of prejudices maybe we had different thoughts and feelings about how important some of those jobs were and actually you know it's not all about getting that you know kind of i must have a degree i must do all the stuff mm. we can do um, yeah. and children should see that actually they can pick roles that are, you know, they can do that and they could really add to society and do something super yeah. important. What an incredible thing to do. Whereas mm. normally it's just like, well, you know, you need to be a doctor or a lawyer or a mm. banker. Or, you know, and for, you know, for lots of young people, it's like, why do I want to do that? Like, you know, yeah. I want to do other things. So it's, it's an interesting time to kind of like reassess some of the ways that we think about what's important, uh, definitely. Mm. Yeah, totally, totally agree. So, when you've been doing the report and now the report is finished what are your reflections about what it means in the coming months for um especially for people who are working with young people what kind of things are you envisioning um about how, maybe how conversations are changing yeah i think there's a lot of things that i've been kind of mulling over about what some of it means um, I think the first thing is, you know, say you're a teacher and you've got a class of 30, maybe normally there'd be like three kids in that class who you'd be like, oh, they're really struggling, you know, they might have low well-being, they might maybe be, you know, struggling with their mental health or maybe kind of, um, you know, safeguarding issues, that kind of thing. Well, actually now teachers need to be thinking, oh, that's probably more like five than it is like mm. three. So who are those other two people in my class that I really need to be kind of paying attention to? So I think that's a really clear one. Um, you know, another thing for me is that thing about choice. You know, we're so um, good at, well, not good, but we're just so used to making decisions on behalf of young people. Um, you know, uh, we might do it as parents, we might do it as social workers or, um, you know, or as teachers or all sorts of different ways where we go, well, we know what's best. So I'm mm. going to make the decision and you're going to go along with it. And actually, we need to think about in the next few months how do we turn around and say well what do you want and how can I help you make that decision so that we can give people a bit more control back over their lives mm. um, and the other thing I've been thinking a lot is um is about that school issue um you know young people know that they're going to have to catch up they know that they're behind now and it's actually really stressful for them so many of them mm. talked about it when we were out consulting you know there were just reams and reams of comments of young people going I don't know how I'm going to catch up. It's so important. If I don't get this right, I'm going to, you know, it's going to affect the rest of my life. And mm -hmm. it means that and be a bit more cognizant of the fact that, yeah, you know, academic containment is important and we do need to kind of catch up maybe. But we can take our time about it and actually we need to mm -hmm. look after ourselves. And, you know, we learn best when we're happy. So actually, yeah. some time to think about how do I reconnect with friends? How do I continue doing that sport, that art, that drama that was keeping, mm -hmm. me, keeping me happy during lockdown? We can't mm -hmm. lose because it's going to help us to do some of the other stuff I think yeah and I think that is vital and a lesson learned for everybody is that it's time to take kind of restock of um what is makes us tick what makes us happy and what empowers us because then that empowers our future and there's no there's no rush there's there's probably people out there who maybe wanted to go into the next step of their career let, and then obviously there's there's children who are thinking about university like I remember when I was 17 and feeling the pressure of well what university do I go to which choices um am I doing my right like uh right subjects and I wasn't really reflecting upon okay well what do I want to do not what the future determines I do so it's actually it's it's really really good to hear that kids want to do that but also that 
how we can support people who work with young people to empower the young people again and um, to make those decisions um, and to also not make those decisions to just just be young again um, and not feel all the pressure because <laughs> I would love to be young again. Um, <laughs> have some fun you know I think like it's been a really difficult time and actually just you know kind of thinking about ways that we can all just kind of um reconnect with some of those more fun things that we do is really important so yeah definitely. so important definitely well we've talked about how um how young people are feeling we've talked about what um they've been saying they've been doing we've talked about how people who support young people how they can help but the government what do we need the government to do? So um, I, I, you know, I almost I feel I feel sorry for um, people who are making decisions at the moment. Um, it's really tough, you know, um, whether you're like a local councillor or in a local authority, whether you're an MP or a civil servant in like mm. Westminster or you know in one of the devolved nations like in Wales or Northern Ireland or Scotland. There's so many things to do. There's so much that mm. needs addressing. There are so many problems. Like where do you begin? Um, I think for us, there are there are kind of four key areas that we really okay. kind of um, honed in on. I think first of all, um, as I've kind of like alluded to, it's that that return to school. We've mm. got to get you know. Um, yes, people are going to need to catch up, but um, let's not make it so stressful that it's going to make people you know even worse um, and mm. make them even more unhappy with their lives because they're under so much stress at school. So getting that school right, I think, is really important. Um, I think we need as well to accept the fact that the, the crisis has increased the numbers of children and young people who are going to have problems and they're going to be struggling and we need kind of a long-term strategy this isn't something that you can fix in four months five months you know you need you know long-term kind of sustainable investment in you know the kinds of support that help children to have good lives and you know that's different for every child but for me you know it's things like youth services which we've seen come massively in the last decade those are the places where you have fun where you meet your friends where you do those things that are actually really important for well-being and um, so it's having a long-term plan in order to make sure that there is the support and the services there to support children and young people to address that increase in low well-being and then the third thing, I guess, comes back to um, the point you were making right at the beginning, and that's that, you know, we're, we're in a recession now as of today. Um, you know, thousands of people have lost work. Um, when we asked families, we asked parents in the survey, most of them, you know, the majority said that they expected their income to decline in the coming year. And they said that they were going to be worried about, you know, having less money in the house. We know that affects children and young people. Mm. And we know growing up in a household with problem debt makes you more likely to have, uh, you know, low well-being. We know that it creates all sorts of different challenges. So there's something about actually, you know, trying to make sure that people can stay in, adults can stay in work and putting more money into the pockets of families, whether that's through that universal credit um, or other ways, just to make sure that, you know, the the kind of financial effects of this crisis um, don't kind of magnify some of the well-being effects of this crisis mm. because they are interlinked. Yeah, and I think it's it's supporting because um, in the report also um, you'd uh, you'd ask some parents as well their their thoughts and their feelings, and it almost matched if a parent was feeling very very worried and struggled. Mm. Um, it was so reflected in the young people um, of the family, and I think that is essential to realise as well is that it's not just supporting. Um, the young people and children but it's also supporting their caregivers because if they're able to feel safe and supported then the young people are only just going to flourish after that um, and I think yeah like um, I think every, it's on everyone's mind about getting the return to school right everybody has a different thought a different strategy but it's about making sure that the young people know that they're they're safe and um, safety but also their mental health is at the forefront of doing that they need to feel that they're they've been put as the heart of the strategy um so you've mentioned as well at the start about um another good uh, good childhood report that we do every year um can you tell us a bit what to expect about the um about that because we're all very excited <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha.
<laughs> I think I am every year. But yeah, um, we are, as usual, going to be publishing our um, annual Good Childhood Report, which is our kind of opportunity to um, just dig into all of the detail about what's going on for children's well-being and how happy they are with their lives in this country um, every year. Um, so we're currently um, on the books for publishing very end of August, uh, just before the bank holiday. Um, and the report is written. I have, you know, it's good to go. It's currently um, being designed and made, being made beautiful um, by our lovely creative team. And um, this year, really, there's kind of three key bits to the report, I think, that um, are, are really, you know, interesting. Um, as ever, we're going to be looking at the trends over time. So are things getting better? Are things getting worse? Um, how have things changed um, from when we published last year? Um, and just kind of giving that kind of that temperature check, like, how are we doing? Are things getting up? Are things going down? How are young people feeling? Um, the second section is um, really interesting because it's it's international um, work. So we've got a big data set that we're using that looks at countries across Europe, and we get to compare 15-year-olds um, uh, in this particular case across Europe. How are they doing? Are they doing better in some countries than others? Why might that be? What reasons could we give for it? And I think that's really important because sometimes um, we tend to kind of think maybe with young people that, well, that's just the way things are. You know, that's mm. just just it's just how it is you know like they're that age adolescent they you know there's nothing we can do to change that but when you look internationally you can see that different countries address these things in different ways and have varying levels of success and i think it's really good to be like yeah we could do things differently and we could make it better and then the final bit is um around friendship so we've been reporting um for a number of years now that children and young people are becoming um less happy with their friendships they're becoming less happy with their friends and um, and more of them are struggling with their friendships and so we kind of felt we needed to do some work to explain why that might be and what was going on so we've done a bit of a deep dive into some of the data and, and looked at a range of factors from bullying and social media use to how many the number of friends that young people might have um, but we've also been out and consulted with young people as well and we've asked them you know what do you think it is that makes friendships difficult or less difficult um these days and how might that be different from you know other times so um yeah it's uh it's been really interesting and we've managed to create um, we've got some beautiful guides so we've got a friendship guide um, from young people to other young people and um, giving them some top tips about how to manage their friendships. Another one, which I think is particularly important, is for like parents, carers. Mm. I think you know, um, we could all reflect in our own childhood, maybe that moment when, you know, somebody, some adult stepped in to try and help us with a friendship and actually made it worse. Mm -hmm. And then advice for adults about how to help young people with their friendships as well. So um, some really like nice things have come out of that, which is, uh, which is lovely. Oh, that sounds so exciting because like you said is that um it's really important to get the young people like young people involved with advice as well because i can like reflect back and think about what advice would i give to my 16 year old self but also i have to remember that times have changed completely yeah. i did not have instagram back then i think instagram came in when i was at uni i think it was um and now people that I know have got little sisters and stuff, they, they will take a photo down if it doesn't have 100 likes. I'm lucky to get like 20 likes on an Instagram photo. Um, so I can't even, it's it's hard to put yourself in those shoes as well, especially when everything's everything's going on as well, which um, is a bit tough for anybody, let alone a young person in today's society. Well, yeah. thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. I know you're very, very busy. We will be having um, more talks about the Good Childhood Report. What date does it come out again? The 28th of August. Put that in your diary, guys. We will be talking about it early September um, and we'll be talking about the reflections and everything. So um, thank you so much for joining us, Richard. Um, no and um, I hope everybody has a nice, relaxing day and doesn't get too hot, go out and sit outside. Um, Richard, try and warm up maybe. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> well, thank you everybody, and we'll catch you next week. Um, so um, bye for now.